Hello everybody, I'm sending you a lot of love and uh, hopefully good reception Oops, from uh, Tel Aviv this time. Next time we'll be in Paris uh, with the help of Mercury. I'll make it there. Oh, I have a little uh, glow. I'm touched. <clears throat> Maybe it will channel itself to my, um, this is to my crown chakra. This is to my third eye. No, okay, let's focus. So um, thanks for making it. Uh, we're going to start off by talking about the week ahead. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about two weeks because the week after, I'm going to be teaching a class in Kabbalah in London. So I won't be able to do this uh, Sunday meeting, but the week after, I'll be with the help of the good Lord in uh, LA. So we'll back to normal. So next week from Paris, uh, I'll do the next, the, the weeks that will come ahead. And today we're going to cover uh, the week ahead. Uh, this is a pretty good week, hopefully, because we're going to have Mercury at last going, going direct after it's been retrograde since uh, Halloween. So we'll be able to take off our costumes uh, that Mars has forced us to put on. So again, I apologize if we're going to be in and out of reception because I can see here that the reception is not the best, but I'll try to do my best and talk really fast so we can ac accomplish everything we need to accomplish before uh, I get uh, turned off. So um, let's start with the week ahead and see what is in store for us. Let's see. So... Um, is this right? January 8th. Are we in January 8th? Yes. So January 8th, we is starting today. Oh my God, this is annoying. Yeah, Zoom is causing a little bit of issues, but I'll um, see. Oh, now it's better. So January 8th, today is a Sunday, even though for some of you it's the end of the day, like for me, for example, because uh, it's 8 o'clock p.m. here. So um, what do we have today? Today we have the moon in Leo and uh, the moon has been on the black moon in the weekend. So if you had a bit more emotional time, uh, that should be much easier very soon because the moon drifted away from being on top of the black moon. This happens once a month that we have to deal with this conjunction of the black moon with the bright moon. And it's not always causing a little bit more emotional energies, a more feeling of uh, a little bit more down. But today we have the moon opposite to Venus. Uh, the next few hours, it's a little bit intense with relationships. So try to avoid any kind of arguments or try to avoid any unpleasantry between you and yourself or you and a significant other, even if it's a partner in work or somebody that you're working with, just to make sure that uh, the Venus opposite to the moon is not so easy. It's not the best time to introduce your new partner to your parents, especially your mother, just because the moon opposite to Venus can sometimes cause glitches or kind of like uh, electrical shocks between a feminine energy that's older and feminine energy that's younger or our partners or relationship compared to uh, um, family members. But the moon in Leo that is going to be with us today and tomorrow on the day of the moon is actually not too bad. It is the moon of love. It is the moon of happiness. It's the moon of creativity. And especially when she gets freed from that opposition with Venus, she's going to be able to feel her uh, connection to the lioness much more. And as you know, the moon, feminine energy, Leo, the lioness, the lioness is the one that actually hunts uh, and actually protects uh, the pride. So that is a um, a good thing for hunting. So if you need anything, achieving anything, the next few days, Monday, Tuesday, will be actually pretty good. We'll see that uh, we're going to have on Tuesday an opposition between the moon and Saturn. This happens once a month. It's not that big of a deal. But the good news that we have today is that Jupiter is sending a beautiful trine to uh, the moon, which actually enforces good uh, emotions or help us heal our emotional state of mind. And also, the moon is going to be sending pretty good energy to Chiron. I told you in the last few days, especially the full moon that was going on in the 6th and 7th, um, 5th and 6th, sorry, of uh, January, you saw what was going on with the Congress in the United States. That lunacy is something that we are all experiencing inside of us, uh, one way or another. 
So that was the moon squaring the Chiron, the wounded healer. Now the moon is actually trining. So all the negativity that was going on around the full moon, January 5 and 6, is starting to get much easier and much better. So in that sense, we're going to be much better tomorrow especially. So if we look at what's going on, uh, on Monday, the day of the moon, the moon is going to be 16 degrees. I mean, the moon is going to be in the middle of Leo, so she's really strong uh, inside Leo. The moon in Leo is happy. The moon in Leo is royal, it's regal. It's a time for you to treat yourself and to treat people around you as if they're royalty. So forget about Prince Harry or Prince William or the Queen or the King, whatever. You need to be your family, royal family. You need to treat yourself the best way you can. So when the moon is in Leo, it's always going to be nice to give yourself a gift. It doesn't have to be spending money on yourself. It could be something you love doing, especially if it's a, anything to do with creativity, anything that brings happiness to yourself. Because, for example, if you're doing yoga, uh, any kind of uh, postures that your hand is above a uh, heart level could really help that moon in Leo, activating the moon. Any kind of uh, cardio, anything that makes you feel, even if you need to watch some uh, washy kind of uh, mushy films or uh, read some romance, you know, it's a very romantic moon. And it is sending a beautiful energy to Mars, beautiful energy to Jupiter, because there's a lot of activity in actually masculine energies in uh, Monday and Tuesday with the moon being in Leo, Mars being in Gemini. Uh, we have Jupiter in uh, Aries. We have Saturn and Venus in, Air, in Aquarius. These are all pretty optimistic, upbeat kind of um, energies. So Mondays, Tuesdays should bring some good energy to us, some kind of uh, good flow. If we look on uh, January 10, which is um, Tuesday, the day of Mars, uh, <clears throat> Mars and Venus are sending perfect energy to each other. We talked about it last week that because of Venus being in Aquarius and Mars being in Gemini, they're sending good energy to each other. And the fact that the moon in Tuesday is still in um, Leo is very, very helpful for this. So again, it's good energy overall in relationship, in partnerships, especially Monday and Tuesday. And also, we talked about how there is a beautiful trine happening between Mercury and Uranus, the Sun and Uranus. This is continuing this week. So anything to do with e-commerce, anything to do with innovation, thinking outside of the box, any kind of uh, positive energy that uh, would relate to practicality is really, really good. Somebody asked, uh, did somebody check the meditation 2023? Yeah, it is available. I actually checked it. Uh, if you go to learn and under learn, I also added another video uh, there that you can watch about 2023. And there is under that um, the meditation for 2023. If you actually click on what it says there, the meditation of 2023, you see it works. I just checked it a few days ago. Uh, no, actually yesterday. So yeah, it's Mercury retrograde. Maybe there's something more personal with your computer. But overall, we are getting closer and closer to the middle of January, which we talked about will be our uh, arrival to the promised land. So yes, Tuesday, we have Venus trining Mars, Mars which is great for relationship. Uh, the moon is still in Leo, but it could be void, of course. So pay attention in Tuesday if you have any very significant, important things to do. Be careful because Moon is going to be at the end of Leo before she moves into Virgo. Depends where you are in the world. Uh, the Moon of Void, of course, could be a little bit intense. But if we look at Wednesday, which is January 11, we have a beautiful trine because the Moon is moving into an Earth sign. So we have the Moon uh, in Virgo, which is all about service. We're moving from being served into service. So the Moon in Leo, which is today, Monday, Tuesday, is shifting the vibe from I need to be served, even serving myself, into the monastery moon, the moon of the nuns, the moons of Stella Maris, which is going to be in um, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And the moon in Virgo works really well with the sun in Capricorn, Mercury in Capricorn, Pluto in Capricorn, Uranus in Taurus. It's going to create a trine. Trine, we talked about it a lot. Trine basically means a beautiful triangle of harmony, flow, good, um, um, anything to do actually with good vibes or good luck or synchronicities, especially practically, especially with money, with finance. 
those things could really work well. So you have very practical days to manifest things. So I would say the first part of the week is coming up with ideas, seeing what you want to hunt. And then the second part of the week could be the actual kill. If you want to be very lion or moon in Virgo, what you actually could do for your work, your health, your diet. There's going to be a lot of healing done Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And pay attention to that triangle. Earth can really ground you. So you're going to have Uranus and the sun, Uranus and Mercury, Uranus and the moon, creating a beautiful triangle of protection, synchronicities, good luck. Things are actually flowing pretty well. So Wednesday, the day that belongs to Mercury, even though Mercury is retrograde, he is in Capricorn. What does that mean? Mercury in Capricorn is very good for any long-term projects. Because it's retrograde, again and again I mentioned it, it's a great time to go back to long-term projects that you failed to do in the past that you can still doing, start doing right now, even if Mars is retrograde. Especially Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, if something comes up, follow through. You know, because I think that there's going to be a lot of uh, opportunities for a lot of you guys, especially if you're an Earth sign. So if you're a Taurus, if you're a Capricorn, if you're a Virgo, or if you lubricate uh, Earth signs, which basically means that you're a Pisces, Cancer, or a um, Scorpio, these Wednesday, Thursday, Friday could be very, very helpful. So if you are an Aries, Leo, and Sag, and Gemini, Aquarius, and Libra, your days are much more Mondays, Tuesdays, and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday is a shift towards much more the feminine energy, the um, energies of the signs that are much more practical and more feminine. So again, <clears throat> Wednesday begins this beautiful trine. You see the trine gets even tighter in um, Thursday when we have Mercury, the Sun, and Pluto sending beautiful vibes to Uranus, the Awakener, and the Moon in Virgo that is still all about service. But look at what's happening to us on Thursday, on January 12th, as promised, Mars is stationary. So that means that even though it's a very earthly, grounded, good days in general, you have this beautiful trine, you do have to step back a little bit on um, Thursday and Friday. Those are the last days of the Mars retrograde. It's not retrograde, it's stationary. Remember we talked about the line from Psalm, Be still and know that I am God. These are great day, Thursday and Friday, to do some deep meditation, to be a little, to walk slower, to talk slower, to breathe slower, to lower the pace if possible. Because even though Mars is in Gemini and Mars is speed and Gemini is a connection and words and communication, we do want to be very, very careful because Mars stationary basically talks about, uh, you know, somebody driving and suddenly stuck, you know, or um, you're downloading a file and suddenly it stops. That frozen energy is really, really tight on Thursday and Friday. The good news is that Saturday and Sunday, Mars is going direct in Gemini. All that pent-up energy that was keeping itself kind of like somehow in that box is bursting out. The genie is coming out. And yes, it's kind of scary, but you know, genie tends to ask us for three wishes. So from Saturday, Sunday, this weekend is going to be very, very powerful with a lot of thrusting energy forward. Just be careful not to uh, do too much or overdo or again, uh, because that energy of Gemini is returning, the conflict between brothers and uh, siblings or sisters and, uh, and relatives, we have to still be careful, especially as Mars adjusts from going reverse for so long to going forward. You know, so just make sure that you're navigating a little bit more uh, carefully Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and next week, hopefully the Mars is going to be re uh, going direct in a much easier way. The good news about this is that the trine that we had tentatively between Venus and Mars, masculine and feminine, uh, passion and art, is going to get tighter and tighter because now Mars is going to be going direct, catching up with the trine with Venus. So that's going to be also something that's going to be very good next week. But you're already going to start feeling it on um, uh, this weekend. 
So if you're looking at Friday, Friday we have the moon moving into Libra, the moon of peace. So there's something moving with air energy, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The moon is going to be in Libra. It talks about breathing. It talks about connection to breath. Mars is going to be starting to stationary in Gemini. Again, it's Earth. It's, it's air breathing. Venus is already in Aquarius. She's going to be there for a few more, for a few days more. Saturn is going to be in Aquarius until March 8th. So again, we're going to have a far powerful energy of Friday, Saturday, Saturday, and even Sunday with a lot of breathing. And because Mars is going to be direct from Saturday, it's going to allow us to actually do something without breathing. It's as if the winds are going to take our sails to the right direction. We're going to be able to glide into much better places. It's not that we're abandoning Earth. Earth is still very dominant. Earth and air are very dominant, but Earth and air creates a lot of squares. So just be a little bit more grounding between your thoughts and your plans and what you can actually manifest and achieve, especially uh, on this weekend coming up to uh, next week. So uh, Friday, great day for... Um, uh, because the moon is going to be in Gemini, again, trining Mars, good connection between action and emotions, passions and feelings. The only thing is that we're going to have a little bit of an issue with Mercury and moon. There could be some misunderstanding. So now that we're going to have Mercury alone retrograde, it's going to be easier to handle him, especially because he also, after uh, uh, January 19, is going to go direct. So again, in January 19, leading up to the Chinese New Year, January 21, 22, is going to be a different vibe, different, uh, uh, completely different energy for us. Saturday, January 14, the moon is sending beautiful energy to Venus. Great time to introduce your new relationship to your family because that's when the moon and Venus are sending perfect energy to each other. Venus and Mars are catching up with their trine, very strong positive energy. And again, Jupiter is doing whatever it can, especially to help uh, with um, Venus. But overall, the moon in Libra in Saturday is flowing pretty well. She's sending beautiful energy to Venus, beautiful energy to Saturn, beautiful energy to Mars. It's almost as if the energy in the weekend is getting a little bit higher uh, because we're moving from more Earth dominant energy to air uh, dominant. And if we look at uh, January 15, which is um, a Sunday, we're going to have the moon at the edge of Libra. Again, pay a little bit attention to void, of course, uh, because um, it could be a little bit tricky on Sunday to start new things. So it's not the best time to start something new, especially because the last degrees of Libra, as some of you know, the few de and, and the degrees, the first few degrees of, not a few, but the first chunk of Scorpio uh, in general is considered to be uh, not the best time or not the best degrees you can say so when the moon is there it creates a little bit more emotional turmoil so sunday even though mars at last is going direct the moon is not in the best position but that happens once a month it's not a big deal you should definitely rejoice that um, mars is going at last direct and again mars direct basically after two what is it October, november december january like after two and a half month or so of being retrograde, especially with the shadow, the pre-retrograde shadow, it's been a long time that Mars has been causing us a little bit more difficulties. Uh, there's going to be a much flowing energy starting from January 15 because Mars is going to go direct. If you were looking to buy a car, you can, nah, maybe you should wait till January 19. If you're needing to take somebody to court, again, you start, you can start doing it. Um, Things are shifting. The energy is shifting very dramatically in January 15. So definitely next Sunday, we're also going to talk about it. It's going to be much easier to make things happen. And the moon being at the end of Libra, moving into Scorpio, is kind of moving from a very high place all the way to the bottom of the sea. You know, so it's going to be uh, going from very superficial energy to very deep energy pretty fast. So uh, make sure you have a parachute and that you have a good submarine around. But the idea is that definitely from next Sunday, January 15, we are going to have Mars at last going direct. It's definitely going to help all of us. So that is uh, the week ahead. Now, what I wanted to share with you also um, is something that came up to me in the last few days. And I think we started developing this idea recently uh, when I told you that I've, I've, I'm 
my way i really like looking at astrology and trying to update it update it for myself i'm not saying that the whole world should follow but i'm trying to test it and to see how it works in people's charts to kind of validate it at least in my readings and since i am doing quite a lot of reading all over the world it does help me manage to see or try to see much more if it is relevant for many different traditions, different age groups and different location, different tradition, different religions. So that helps me, again, validate it over space and time. And one of the things that made that is really interesting for me lately is the idea behind the fourth house or to make it more plain, the archetype of cancer. Cancer, as you know, and some of you are cancer, some of you are cancer rising, some of you have your moon in cancer, but all of you have cancer someplace in your chart. And some of you also have, all of you, have something in your fourth house. And that fourth house and cancer, they share the same archetype, represent immovable objects. Things that cannot be moved. Uh, for example, somebody said that they're Venus in cancer. Your Venus cannot be moved. It's not that they're trapped like vampires in some kind of um, a, um, casket. The idea is that cancer, unlike Taurus, Taurus that rules security, just like cancer, but more financial security, that needs stability, just like cancer, they are ruling things that can be picked up and moved around. So this chair can be picked up, it's ruled by Taurus. This mic can be picked up and thrown away, sold, okay, that's Taurus. Taurus represents things that can move around, that can pick up. Cancer represents land. The land cannot be picked up or buildings or real estate. Yeah, I know that some of you have prefabric uh, houses these days, but that's Aquarius interfering, you know, technology innovation. But the idea of the house that cannot be lifted, the land that cannot be lifted. But then again, cancer also rules your family. And we talked about it symbolically speaking. You cannot divorce your mother or your father or your brother or your uncle. These are people that are connected to you and this idea of your family is immovable now it's not in-laws in-laws are ruled by Sagittarius it's something different they can totally be moved you, you get rid of uh, your, your husband and somehow your his family can drift away you know not forever not because they're still the grandparents of your kids but that's a different story the idea behind cancer is people that share your DNA and your DNA cannot be moved. It can be activated by epigenetics. It can be silent. It can be enhanced by eating well, by exercising. It can be repressed by eating shit and um, being a, a couch potato or potato couch. I always get confused by who comes first, but basically they're together. They're not moving. So yes, there is a range by which your genetics can move. But the idea is that it's immovable. You cannot undo your genes in a sense. You can fix them, you can elaborate them, but they're stuck, they're fixed, and they represent your family. So genes and genetics in general, for me, is very much connected to cancer. Cancer also rules, like I said, land, therefore geography. So that's why we say motherland, because it is the land that you were born into that cannot be changed. You cannot be you know, you cannot go to an astrologer and say uh, when you are living in Turkey that I was born in Istanbul and then because you live in uh, New York to say suddenly, no, I was born in New York. You're not born in New York. You live in New York, but you will never be able to change the fact that you were born in Istanbul. That is immovable. And that is what cancer is all about. <clears throat> and this, uh, I wanted to share this idea with you and I prepared something small that we can look into together. Those of you guys who are in um, live Instagram, if you sign into my, um, into my bio, you'll be able to also join the Zoom class. So I'll send you later on what we talked about in Zoom. Um, slideshow. So what I wanted to show you guys is something interesting that happened to me yesterday. Ah, before, before uh, we go there, some of you have seen the fiasco that was going on in the Congress in the United States, that they couldn't find a speaker to the House. Uh, again, talking about immovable object, House, Homes, Congress. But the idea is that it came up again and again and again in all these newspapers that it didn't happen since 1859. Everybody was saying that it hasn't happened, that they had to go again and again and again into uh, voting to find um, the Speaker of the House. 
since 1859. And you know me by now, I love history and I love astrology and they're very much linked together. So what I did, I looked to see the chart, what happened in 1859 and why is 1859 all over the news? Well, 1859, Neptune was 22 degrees Pisces. Again, Pisces is the sign of confusion. 22, remember we talked about it, it's associated with the fool, the joker. And woe and behold, this is the chart of um, uh, January 1st, 1859. You see, 22 degrees Pisces. Sorry, this is for January 6, 2023. 22 degrees Pisces. It is a Neptune return. And funny enough, it's a Neptune return because it happens once every 165 years approximately. It depends on the cycles of, uh, Vir uh, of uh, um, Pisces. And it is happening again right now. I mean, think about it. It takes so much time for Neptune to return to the same degree. And it came back to confuse Pisces. Remember, Pisces always for me is Alice in Wonderland. I don't know who I am. Sometimes I'm big, sometimes I'm small. Pisces don't always know who they are because they're the last sign. And 22, remember we talked about it a lot of time. It's related to the fool, the joker. The joker is zero in the tarot card. And of course, because of a bunch of seven fools in the Congress, that was the reason why all of this started happening. But it's eerie how it is the 22 degrees Pisces was happening in 1859 and it's happened also last week and it also is the degree of Neptune in the chart of United States and that's what we talked about United States going through a Neptune return so that's kind of a interesting thing we'll talk about the Congress next week as well uh, because of uh, a discovery I've made about what is the issue with Congress compared to Senate not that I'm saying the Senate is amazing but the Congress is completely messed up so we'll talk about it next week but I wanted to take you on a journey because uh, I was just in Haifa where I was born and my whole family converges there because uh, they actually live there, most of them except my brother who lives here in Tel Aviv. But um, we all converged in Haifa and my mother wanted to take us to the place that she was born and um, that she grew up mainly and actually she was born there and she, she was born in Afula, not too far, but she grew up uh, most of her life in a place called Bad Galim. Bat Galim is the daughter of waves and it's kind of interesting because my mother is one of the first competitive swimmers that were actually born in Israel the early 40s. At that time the Brits were uh, having their mandate over Israel. They, after World War I they received governorship over Israel that lasted until 1948. But the neighborhood when she was born is a relative uh, established neighborhood in 1920s. It was a garden suburb right on the water, right on the waves. Uh, and a neighborhood of Bauhaus and it's named after a sentence from or sen a stanza from uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 10 from the Bible cry thou with a thrill voice O daughters of Galim and that's by the way why I'm named Gal uh, Gal means a wave and my mother was always fascinated by waves she was born in the uh, daughter of waves and indeed she became a swimmer now that's not what I'm going to try talk about I wanted to take it a little bit further because in that trip that my mother made for us, uh, she took us there to that uh, place, to Bad Galim. And if you're ever in Israel and you ever come to Haifa, highly recommend to go there. It turned out to be <clears throat> that naming that place the Daughter of Waves was a very wise thing because apparently it's the best surfing spot in Israel for surfers. So we went there, uh, when was it? Yesterday? What was it? What day is today? Sunday? Saturday. Yeah, we went there Saturday, just yesterday. And even when you look at the street when she was, where she was uh, living most of her um, uh, young life, uh, you can see swimsuits there hanging out because of all the surfers. And it's just next to the base, uh, the marine base in Israel, that the submarines are there, uh, the um, uh, military is there, for the, at least for the uh, uh, marines. So you have a lot of these uh, surfers walking around there even in a rainy day that was yesterday. The interesting thing about that, uh, and that's why I wanted you to um, join me, is that my mother took us there because there was something really interesting going on. First of all, the name of the street, and remember I told you to always pay attention to names of streets. And the name of the street is Kalaim. Kalaim in Hebrew means the slingshots. But the Kalaim were actually the... Um, 
the uh, Jewish brigade that were volunteering in World War I in the British Army, hoping that to persuade the Brits after the war, World War I is done to give uh, the land of Israel to the Jews. So they basically had a brigadier or like a, a troop, a, a group of uh, Jewish volunteers, and they called themselves Kalaim, which in Hebrew stands for slingshot. Now it's interesting, it's nothing compared, to, I mean it's not connected completely, but I was reading a book that was mentioning it, so I'll mention it also, that the etymology of sin, you know, when you sin, when you do something bad, and it's also in Hebrew, the same thing, it's kind of interesting, it's English and in uh, Hebrew, the word sin, to sin, you know, like the original thing, sin, is actually from ancient Greek, and it, Greek, sorry, and it means to miss the target, to be off target, to be off mark, so you're a sinner, not because you've done something bad with God, but because you missed the mark. You're supposed to go someplace, you were supposed to shoot something, and you missed the mark. And the same thing is in Hebrew, chet, in Hebrew, which means um, to sin, is also to miss the mark. Um, now, it's kind of interesting, because we went to visit not only the place where mother was, uh, lived her life, which is a kalaim esel, or ten, which is very symbolic, it is the end of the street, and this is where I'm going into the genes and geography. Because my um, nephew, he's now in the submarines, so he's uh, serving not too far from there, and he needed to rent a place. And he looked all over uh, the area, and finally he found the perfect place with his roommates, and they found a perfect building, and they loved it there. When my mother came the first time to visit them, she completely had a meltdown because it was the same apartment building where she grew up. So we didn't plan it. We didn't even know it. It was kind of crazy. Everybody was saying, what a coincidence. I mean, come on, there is so many buildings all over the city and that the grandson will come to the same building, the same apartment that my mother lived most of her life. And the reason why she called me even Gal it's kind of eerie, and that's what made me think about how genetics activate geography, geography activate genetics, and how, how these kind of things connect our genes, our DNA, our geography, where we decide to be born, who we decide to be born to. All of these things are linked, and I really encourage you guys to do the same kind of investigation. It's not only a synchronicity, it's a plan. It's a plan to bring back our genetics to where it feels comfortable, where it feels safe. Remember, cancer is about the shell. Cancer is the womb. So this is, for example, the view you see from the uh, apartment building. It's kind of interesting. And it's kind of interesting how the grandson of my, my, my mother came 60 years later <clears throat> to the same place that she lived. And again, if you remember, 60 is a second Saturn return. So it took two Saturn returns, Saturn is karma, to bring the ancestral karma to the same spot. And this is the first time he basically lives on his own, in his own apartment outside of my mother's, uh, my sister's place. So this is the first time he declares independence and it is in my grandmother's home. I mean, it's not owned by her. Now this is where it's really crazy. Because the apartment it turned out to be belongs, I mean, the owner of the apartment is one of the best friends of my, of the sister of the guy that's living there's husband. Okay, let me make it more clear. His brother-in-law, his best friend is the owner of that apartment. So think about how all of these things are all linked together. The owner of the apartment that rents it to the grand, grandson of my mother is the best friend of his brother-in-law. So this is what I meant by tribes, by, spirit, by, by your ancestor, by your soul tribe, by people that travel together. They don't even have to only be with blood because obviously my nephew, my niece's uh, husband is not connected to us genetically and yet he's the one that rents the apartment that used to belong to my uh, grandmother and her, my mother. You know, so again, I really recommend it. Now, the other thing is I went to uh, the, the, the other side of the uh, apartment and I looked through the window and what do I see? Elijah's cave. And you know from some of my workshop that I brought you guys the authentic red string 
a Kabbalistic red string that I'm going to also give you guys if you come to my workshop in uh, London to the Kabbalah workshop. Those protective um, red strings can only come from the tomb of Rachel or from the cave of Elijah that is located in the Carmel. And it's right here, you can see the cave, and this is the view from the apartment. It's as if my mother looked every day out through the window and what she could see is the Stella Maris Monastery. It's a Catholic, it's Catholic Christian monastery um, that is called the Carmelite monks. And to see the cave of Elijah, little did she know that I will be dealing with these kind of things. And that's when I told you guys that I take, uh, that my mother likes to knit and that I take her uh, organic red string from knitting and I put it in the uh, cave of Elijah to bless it and then I cut it and some of you guys uh, joined in in Omega, some of you guys joined me in Esalen, some of you guys joined me in London when I gave those strings from the cave of Elijah. I didn't even know that from my nephew slash from my mother's house, you can actually see it and you see the distance. It's about 100, 200 uh, meters. This is uh, the monastery from above, the Stella Maris uh, monastery. And this is my nephew DJing. This is my mother instructing everybody around that apartment. This is the apartment over here. And this is all the clan of us um, by the sea. And it was raining. Now I wanted to take it to the next level because it's getting even more interesting because then I thought about it and I think I mentioned it here. I wrote the book on Kabbalah in uh, 2003, it was 20 years ago, and uh, it's a book on Kabbalah, and the first people or the first country that wanted to translate my book was Turkey. I remember that day I got an email from um, uh, the guy who's a really good friend of mine, the publisher of uh, the books in Turkey, you guys, some of you know uh, the books that I published even still every year in um, uh, Turkey. And he emailed me, I think it was from uh, Pune, from India, saying, hey, we love your book. If you can come to Istanbul, it will be great. We're translating your book. I said, sure, I'll go. But the funny thing is that my grandfather from my father's side this time is Turkish. So again, it's as if my gene called out, hey, translate us, translate us. Because what are the possibilities of a book on Kabbalah that the first translation will come from Turkey. I mean, I didn't call Turkey and say, hey, my grandfather is Turkish. I demand that you translate my book to Turkish. No, it happened. And what was the second country that translated my book to um, a <clears throat> of Kabbalah? It was Bulgaria. So my grandfather came from Turkey. He moved to Bulgaria. And my father and my other grandmother was born in Bulgaria. So again, genes talk to us. It's always about question, are we listening? And that's true about all the time. I don't think it's only our genes. I think we talk, everybody talks, the universe talks to us, but it's our job to actually listen. So again, we have always told you that during Mars retrograde, during Venus retrograde, during Mercury retrograde, there is, oh, did I mention it? Yeah, all of the synchronicities are happening much, much, much more quick. So. Pay attention. Mars retrograde and Mercury retrograde are not a bad thing. They're great for synchronicities and for discovery things that belong to the past, even if it is past life or the past that is written in our genetics. Let's see if there's any questions. Um, yeah, if you guys are in Paris, I'm coming in Thursday. No, Wednesday. Wednesday, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be teaching on Friday, a class on 2023. So if you guys know anybody in Paris, you can uh, send my way. And on Saturday, we're going to do the class on past lifetime regression. And then in London, I'm going to do a class on past lifetime regression, 2023. All of them are going to be also virtual, so you can join. The links are there. And also, we're going to do a class on Kabbalah, a three-hour class. And we're going to do a class on time travel meditation. So let's see, are there any questions? Um, yeah, any cancer that you have is where you have those mysteries unveiling those uh, genetic geographical things. Um, yeah, thank you uh, Zlatina for confirming that I'm not the only one that can hear it. Um, couch potato, so always to remember the couch and then the potato, okay. Also happened to Bulgarian National Assembly. Can you say something about the political situation? You know, it's not a coincidence that this is happening to Bulgaria and to Israel because both countries are Taurus. 
and Uranus, the planet of unpredictable. Ah, wait, wait, you're talking about um, um, Bulgaria and the United States. Yeah, I think it's in Bulgaria's case, it's not the Congress, it's not the Neptune in 22 degrees occur in Pisces. It's something different. It's the similar thing that's happening here in Israel that we have the worst kind of government possible. Uh, they're trying to literally disarm the, uh, um, the, the uh, Supreme Court here. It's, it's really sad, but uh, Turk, I mean, Israel and Bulgaria are both Tauruses. And Uranus is now the unpredictable, crazy energy is in Taurus, at least until 2026. It's going to be very tough for both countries. Let's see. Yes. Um, any meditation definitely works. Well, thank you very much. Um, I need to uh, go grab something to eat before everything closes. Thanks a lot for uh, being with me and um, I hope I see you in person in Paris or in London or back when I'm in LA. Again, you can go and see on my um, website. We're going to also have a special class for Valentine's on the 13th of February in LA, which is also going to be virtual about the alchemy of relationships, how to work with partnerships. Thanks a lot and um, great week. See you next week from Paris.